so good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome from sunny Zurich. The sun has finally made an appearance in Europe, and uh, we're delighted to invite you in the most recent of our Human Capital Analytics webinar. And the subject today is how to make your reward decisions data-driven in a new market. So who's joining you? So uh, maybe by now a few of you uh, uh, know me. I'm Sarah Kane. I'm the one on the left. I'm a partner with PwC based here in Zurich. And uh, for those of you who are regular joiners of our webinar, you will recognize that we're, we're crawling the world and the network to find people who have interesting stories to tell about uh, human capital analytics. And we're really delighted to welcome Igor with us today, uh, live from Moscow. Igor, how's the weather over there? Everything is sunny in Moscow. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Igor. Uh, I'm manager in the in the Russian PwC People and Organization uh, company, uh, and I've been with PwC for the last three years uh, and seven years before. I have also been focusing on the reward and organizational development. Recently. Uh, I combine it with the HR analytics topics and uh, hopefully today I will be able to tell you a very interesting case and a very interesting story on how it is done. Perfect, thanks Igor. So just before we uh, dive into the content today, we have about uh, an hour together. I just wanted to do a bit of a, a promotion for our um, analytics webinar series. So uh, we just recognized this morning that this is our first year anniversary. So we've, uh, we've concluded the first year. And for those of you who have missed some of the back catalog, uh, we will send out the link uh, following this webinar and you can go back and have a look. And we've really covered a huge range of topics around this from strategic workforce planning to visualizations to um, to looking at how we can use data to bring together uh, talent topics and a high performing team so please feel free to go back and uh, um, have a look at those i'd also like to just give a, a quick shout out for moritz ackerman who's here with me in zurich who's uh, been part of the uh, webinar crew for the whole year, and unfortunately, we're losing Moritz. He's going on to bigger and brighter things, new jobs in PwC, but he's the one that's made sure that technically and logistically and content-wise, we get all this and we pull all this together, including all of our guests. So thank you ever so much, Moritz, for thank everything you. that you've done for us for the last year. Okay, and then just to navigate you around, uh, we use Big Marker as our uh, webinar tool here. Hopefully you can see on the right hand side that there's a chat function and you're able to put in your Q&A in there. Uh, the Q&A will come to us and I will um, make sure that I interject and um, ask Igor all your very difficult questions that you'd have. So please do. Uh, I think it makes the webinars a bit more lively if you come to us with questions and challenges if, if things aren't as clear as they should be. So please uh, fill up and uh, uh, bring us your questions, please. Okay, so let's... Uh, we're a couple of minutes in, I can still see a couple of people joining, but let's get into the content. So when we think about, uh, when we think about, I suppose that whole area of reward, I mean, your slide, Igor, says it's the most fruitful area for HR analytics. Tell us, tell us a bit more, why do you think organizations, I mean, I guess it's, an, it's a data-driven function, it's about the numbers, but uh, t tell us your view, Igor. Well, uh, there is a number of uh, arguments for focusing your HR analytics efforts on the reward area. First of all, of course, it's the data-driven uh, HR function, and you have a lot of data. You have a lot of data about reward, about the territory that you are operating in, about the uh, people that you are rewarding. And you can do a lot of with, uh, and you can do a lot with this data. Uh, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, recently, and we have discussed this also uh, with Sarah today, that recently organizations are getting more and more 
accurate and want to spend the money appropriately. So you don't want to uh, boil the ocean with money uh, if you don't have to, and you don't want to pay uh, uh, for the job, for the work that that is rewarded lower in the market, uh, and you don't want to pay more than market pays usually. And at the same time, you don't want to lose the people due to the low reward. Uh, so uh, by applying a very simple tools and by applying a very simple data-driven approach to the reward, which I will be uh, showing to you today, you can balance the amount of uh, money and the amount of effort spent by organization with the value that the organization gets from the people. Perfect. Yeah, so it's not just about, I suppose our point is not just about saving money, but it's making sure that the, the money that you're investing in reward, which can be really big numbers, is really used appropriately and you're finding the right, the right channels for it. Okay, so take us through, so I think you have a couple of, um, take us through what, what are we going to hear in the next hour, Igor? I think you've got a couple of cases to show, share with us. Well, yeah, basically today I will be talking to you, with you on the three main questions which uh, every HR director deals with while uh, thinking about rewards and while building their remuneration system. First of all is how can you balance the employer remuneration? How can you make sure that you are neither paying too much, neither paying not enough? Because uh, in the first case, uh, you just waste money. In the second case, and usually that's the case, you just lose people. Uh, on the other hand, besides uh, just setting the right salary levels, there is also a question of how, to, how do you apply the rules of the game? How do you uh, set the exact number, uh, the exact reward which will be received by exact person? Uh, or what would be the variation? What are the rules uh, that uh, can be used by organization to uh, give the people opportunity to increase their revenue? and increase the wage. And the third question which I will be covering today is, uh, well, basically, how do you administer this quite complex, usually it's quite complex system, uh, and how do you make sure that you are receiving the right effects from the uh, reward system that you have built on the data you have gathered? Uh, I will not be taking. Uh, I will not be talking about many cases today, but uh, I think that uh, the case that I will present will be very useful because I will be talking about the uh, distribution organization which operates in Russia, uh, and I have done this project with them. Uh, a year and a half ago, uh, and I have went with them through all the steps that I will be describing today. Uh, and uh, um, hopefully you will see the value and um, the story uh, that I'm going to tell you. First of all, a little bit about the organization itself. It's the uh, FMCG distribution company, which basically means that uh, at one point, they come to the FMCG uh, production, for example, Coca-Cola, for example, BAT, and they buy the at the wholesale amounts. They buy the Coca-Cola cans, they buy the cigarette packs, they buy the uh, batteries, and so on and so forth. Then they take those goods to the local retailers. Usually, it's very small, very um, uh, price sensitive uh, retailers, uh, cash and carry points, or some maybe local retail branches. And basically, uh, the organization leaves off the difference between the amount they pay to the production and the amount they receive from the uh, local retail, street retailer. Um, uh, so the organization is very sensitive to the working capital they have. The organization is very sensitive to the uh, all the topics and all the budget uh, constraints they're having. And one of the key uh, leverage and one of the key financial leverage for them was the uh, reward of the people. Uh, it made about 60% of their overall costs and they were very sensitive in this area. So, and they were always looking uh, how to optimize the reward that they are spending. So at some point, we were approached by a chair director who requested us to review this system uh, of reward for the whole organization. 
and to find units, to find the opportunities to uh, maybe somewhere review the rewards, maybe somewhere in, you increase them, maybe somewhere you lower them, uh, depending on the market situation in this or that particular town which company operates in. And for you to understand, Russia is quite a big country, so uh, the um, organization was working in almost 300 cities throughout the country. Uh, later in my presentation, I will be referring to the regions and to the macro regions. So Russia is divided by seven so-called macro regions. Uh, you see them uh, on the slide. And also Russia is divided by the regions. And when we are talking about the country and we are, when, we, when we are talking about the city, uh, uh, we should understand that in one city, in one region, there might be a dozen of the cities in which company works, and uh, salary in these uh, regions, it will be, in, in these cities, it will be different. So, for example, when you have Moscow region, there is Moscow and there's Yaroslav in there, and salary in those uh, two cities, well, it can differ by almost 30 percent. Uh, so on the one hand, the company had a lot of points and a lot of markets where, where it operated. Uh, you must understand that if we have 300 cities at the moment, that means that in a year or two we will be ha having 400 cities and so on and so forth. That's on the one hand. and the, or the, On the other hand, the company is quite big in terms of uh, employees. Uh, we were working only with five grades. Uh, in the organization, uh, mostly the logistical staff and mostly the sales staff, uh, but nonetheless we had to deal with uh, 6.5 thousand employees in the database, uh, which uh, also increased the complexity of the exercise and which also allowed us to find a lot of opportunities to balance uh, the reward that company was paying to the uh, particular people with the reward which was suitable for the particular city and for, for the particular uh, labor market. Um, the task was basically uh, split in three uh, in three steps. First of all, we needed to review and rebalance overall approach to the um, reward to the reward system that the uh, that the company was applying to its employees. And when I'm talking about the optimizing the reward, basically it's the trick of balancing internal fairness and external competitiveness. So on the one hand, you have to give a similar reward for the similar value added uh, at the particular job. So you can't, if you have uh, two people who do the same job, who add the same value to the organization, you can't pay them a uh, different reward. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, you always have to keep in mind the external competitiveness, the labor market and the scarcity of the talent and the scarcity of basically the working hands in different cities that you work in is very different. And for the same uh, job and for the same amount of tasks delivered in city A, you can pay, let's say, 100 euro. But in another city, when there's not enough uh, people, you basically have to pay 150 euro just to get somebody in the place. Uh, so when we were talking about the particular company, you can understand that they are having like 300 cities where uh, market data varies a lot. And sometimes you just don't have the understanding of how much the people are paid in the particular city. Uh, cause there's just no data. Uh, and at the same time, you have to clearly understand for what are you paying? What is the um, amount of value added by the particular job and how much are you ready to pay for it? Besides that, there is also other factors that you need to, to account for. It's of course the low compliance. It's of course the comprehensiveness of the system. It's of course the, uh, well, it's hard to make such a system easy for, let's say, backend for the HR, but uh, the system must be very easy to apply and to understand for the uh, front end, for the managers, for the uh, employees. And in the same time, it have to be flexible because you can't always uh, have the right decision in the headquarters. Sometimes the right decision can be only made uh, down there, down to earth or in the particular city. And once again, as I have mentioned, for the company, the labor curse were the biggest uh, cost. So um, the overall reward system was cost effective. 
Uh, sometimes in uh, different types of organizations, we just see that organizations are not ready to deal with the reward in terms of making it data-driven, in, in making it very, very articulate and very complex. But for some industries and for some companies, it's just, uh, it's just a matter of whether or not you will be successful as the financial organization. So, uh, the yes? Yeah, no, I was just going to say there's a, there's a couple of things that, that strikes me here. So clearly you're dealing with a market that is um, uh, not homogenous, so you're having to really kind of be refined and deal with individual local differences within sort of almost, well, maybe it's wrong to say micro geographies, but really understanding that geographical com um, context. But the other thing that struck me was the number of unique jobs that you're, you're looking at as well. So can you tell us any more about those 62, you know, 62 unique jobs across a population of nearly 7,000? Feels like a, uh, feels like a, feels like a lot of, um, roles for the sales and logistics functions. Are you able to tell us a little bit more about those roles that you were dealing with? Well, yeah, I'll tell about this a little bit later. Well, uh, the number of unique jobs with which uh, we were dealing with at the beginning of the project and at the beginning of the job was 62, but by the end we narrowed it down to 13, and I will tell you how we did it. Um, the, but basically, the, the such a big amount of jobs was due to uh, the organization was trying to differentiate people by, not by managing their salary levels, but by managing their job titles. Uh, and, well, that's not the best practice, let's call it that way. And uh, by the end of the exercise, the number of unique jobs was lowered a lot, and I will tell you how it was done. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Sarah. So, uh, how do you usually solve an issue? How, how do you usually make your uh, reward system f uh, fair in terms of internal fairness and competitive in terms of external competitiveness? Well, usually you take the salary review from a very good provider, which for example PWC is, uh, or some other providers which are there at the market. Or you can use your historically built uh, reward system, you know, use your historical data and uh, basically tweak here and there and make ad hoc decisions. Or you can uh, try and create something very special. For example, in the particular, uh, in, in some countries, uh, sorry, in some organizations that uh, we deal with uh, in Russia, they try to create a typology of the cities, they make the discounted uh, salary levels and so on and so forth. So you try to create something unique. In either, in either case, in either approach, you will always have a lot of issues. First of all, when you are talking not about the data driven approach, but about the uh, point number two and point number three, approach number two and approach number three, you are dealing with a lot of biases. Uh, all people have biases, only data doesn't have biases. Um, next, the more complex your organization is, the less effective your decisions are. The more and more exceptions you have to do, and uh, the more and more um, gruesome uh, the task of managing this whole story becomes. And third, the more and more complex uh, organization you have, uh, the more and more it is costs you just to administer the uh, salary structure, just to review the salary levels, just to see uh, what is the uh, optimal payment in this or that particular city, and that's always an issue. Uh, but usually, uh, how we see it, at least with the big organizations, which operate in uh, well-known uh, cities and in the big cities, usually you just take salary review. But it doesn't always work, and it didn't work for the client uh, who thought that they are dealing quite okay with their reward, but when we deep-dived into the data, we saw a lot of stuff. For example, uh, uh, let's uh, say that uh, you are operating in 300 cities. When you review the uh, data available to you from the provider, for example, provider XXX and provider uh, PWC, you can see that only 54 at best out of 300, at best only 54 cities you have data. So for 250 cities, you just try to make something up. How do you do it? 
Uh, well, for example, you can take uh, the whole region, uh, if you're talking about Russia, you can take the whole region and say, okay, so there is the Moscow region, and in Moscow, the salary for this particular job is like 100 euro. So in all the cities in the region, we will be paying for this uh, job 100 euro. In that case, you will cover uh, around 126 cities out of 300 that you are having. But uh, once again, for the biggest part of the population and for the biggest number of cities, you will be just basically guessing. Uh, to some extent, this uh, problem is covered by uh, official statistics, which is available uh, to organizations in Russia and basically in every European country about the average income or average salary or average wage that is present for the particular city that is actual for the particular city but there is an issue here you can't build on that data because for uh, for one uh, point you can't really say that this is fully reliable data there are biases there is lack of information there is uh, under reporting there is over reporting that's on the one hand and on the other hand you for every particular city you just receive one data point you receive okay so on average person in this city receives let's say 100 euro but uh, how much does a person makes on this or that particular rate or this or that particular job you can never tell it from the official statistics but there is an answer to that um, uh, I don't know can you maybe uh, uh, you all, all of you have the chat window somewhere on your screen can you please uh, send me something like plus or yes if you have heard about the regression analysis. Just type your message and make it yes, I have heard or something. So, the, so Igor, I think the question is you're asking people to go into the chat and just yep. type uh, a yes if they... If you know uh, what is the regression. If they yes, if they understand what a regression analysis is. And maybe type no if you have uh, if you don't know what a regression analysis is. Do you find your chat on the right hand the side? Right of side the, on the screen. Yeah. And maybe you just do it as a. Uh, yeah, you should be able to just chat. Reluctant chatters. Well, I know what the regression is. I have sent it to the chat. Well, I think it's probably safe to assume there are at least a couple of people who would appreciate your overview of what a regression okay. analysis is, Google, please. So, well, basically, uh, maybe, uh, useful unfortunately, for the rest of us. unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, but to make story short, basically, when you have two uh, sets of data about the similar... Uh, uh, entity for example the city uh, and you have uh, for one set of data you have data on all the cities like uh, we can say for all the cities what the what is the average reward what is the average salary in the city uh, by the uh, official statistics and uh, in other data set you only have like 50 or 60 uh, data points but you can see what is the uh, equation how can you uh, create how can you um, uh, understand what is the uh, what should be the reward levels on this or that particular grade uh, in this or that particular city if there is the uh, data for uh, statistic uh, is there if there is a data for the official wage uh, I uh, I don't think that I will be able to uh, describe it to you in uh, details at this time and in this language, but uh, just uh, make a note and make sure that you um, deep dive into the regression concept. It basically allows you to build on the data that you have to create and to understand the data you don't have. And using the regression analysis um, for the particular data sets that we were operating uh, and that we were working with in these 300 cities, we were able to find, to define the uh, reward levels, the uh, market salary levels for each and every city that uh, the company was operating in. Whether or not it was reported by the salary surveys or not, we have always the opportunity to 
see what is the market reward for this or that particular work. And that allowed us to uh, significantly increase the accuracy of our reward system. That allowed us to say not just for 29% of the population what is the uh, factual reward that they are having uh, in this or that, what is the factual market reward that one should have for uh, the uh, job in this or that particular city, but overall what is the uh, reward, what, what are the money that people are receiving for this type of job. Of course, uh, to some extent, uh, the data that we uh, get from the regression analysis was uh, technical, but we checked for it uh, and uh, it was correct. So uh, after applying a very okay. simple regression so analysis maybe, uh, tool. Yeah? Yeah, so yes, maybe a question there, Igor. So I suppose it's this, it's this notion, right, of taking two I suppose almost incomplete data sets and trying to work mm -hmm. out if you can put them together to create some um, uh, uh, insight data into set, yes. mm -hmm. for this for this circumstances really the you know for the cities where you didn't have the the PwC or other providers benchmark data how did you extrapolate that and start to come up with um, what you felt did you but and just I suppose a question and I understand the sort of mathematical validity of your approach but maybe a question in terms of did you actually test it did you actually sort of go and say right Vladivostok we've now you know we didn't have good market data but now our regression analysis is giving is pointing in this direction how did you test uh, the accuracy of what you'd come up with uh, well, basically, uh, thank you for the question. Basically, we looked at the regression analysis and we searched for the spikes or some uh, data points or some cities where we received an unexpected result, results. And after that, we basically called the headhunters, called the recruitment agencies in the particular city. That wasn't Vladivostok, but that was, for example, Yeisk. Uh, and we called to the YASC uh, and we asked the headhunters, okay, so how much does on average you see that this or that type of work is being rewarded? What is the salary level for this or that grade in your particular city? And most, we did a lot about, um, we did this test and we did this for 20 cities out of 140 which were uh, in the regression analysis. Uh, and uh, mostly we get the right numbers. Of course, there's some level of the accuracy here, so we don't say in that uh, the regression analysis allows us to get the highest accuracy of the uh, salary levels in the city, but uh, it does provide us with the information accurate enough, and we check that basically by contacting the local people. Okay. So what I think you heard you say was you were looking in the data and looking at looking for that that twenty percent of outliers that could have been errors and trying to test and validate those and by kind of validating those outliers you increased your confidence in the overall results. Is that a fair summary? Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that was the step number one. We had our database for external competitiveness. The step number two is the um, question of internal fairness. So how do you uh, make the reward uh, fair internally? Well, you need uh, basically to, uh, you need two things to consider when you are thinking about that question. First of all, you have to have equal pay for equal work. And usually big organizations uh, apply a grading system of this or that type of grading system where you evaluate each and every job in the organization by the level of know-how which is required to deliver to, to have the job to deliver the tasks by the complexity of problem solving and by the levels of accountability uh, that are present for this or that job and that allows you to um, on the one hand uh, catch the uniqueness of each and particular job and on the other hand um, to compare the jobs to understand which one is more uh, complex which one is bigger which one should be paid higher and which one should be paid less because it's less know-how it's uh, more, more simple problems and it's less accountability uh, in the particular organization they already had great system in the place uh, 
and we just take it as the input for our database. The second question is the second question of uh, internal fairness is of course the uh, what is the value generated by this or that particular city? Um, and what I mean by that? Uh, well, obviously, when you have a lot of um, when you have a lot of warehouses and uh, Salesforce teams in different uh, cities, some of cities are more important, uh, are more valuable, create more value for the organization than others. And uh, if you want to, beat, uh, to build a really fair uh, reward system, you need to take that into the account. And there's a lot of uh, aspects, there's a lot of uh, topics uh, on which uh, cities can differ uh, from uh, one from another for the business. For example, uh, the uh, level of the strategic priority of the city. You might have a big cities where organization want to be at its best and you might have a very small cities where organization just, well, historically we are there and I think we should stay there and that's it. That's uh, one topic. The other topic is the number of clients that you're having in the particular city. Uh, the third topic is the profitability of the operations in the particular city and so on and so forth. And uh, you have to, when, when you are thinking about the internal fairness, you have to take all of those into the account, all those topics, all those points. And here we come to the second, uh, once again, quite simple HR analytic tool, which helps you to understand the value of this of that particular city. It's called cluster analysis. I'm not going to uh, elaborate about it a lot, but long story short, when you have a lot of data points, when you have, for example, 300 cities and you need to understand uh, is there any similarities between them? You can take, for example, and group them. You can group them by this or that uh, variables. You can group them by profitability, you can group them by the number of people who are working in this or that particular city, and so on and so forth. And to do so, you use cluster analysis. Basically, uh, by clustering, uh, when you are clustering cities, you review the similarities between this or that city. Let's say the distance between every city in the Russia. Uh, when you see when you see the map of the country, you can see that some cities are closer one to another than um, other cities, and you can see that at some point you just see the groupings of the cities based on their distance uh, between watch one another. The same logic can be applied to any variable. For example, you can group uh, cities by the uh, profitability. You can group cities by their revenue. You can group cities by the uh, amount of people uh, that are working in this or that particular cities. But uh, the most effective approach is when you combine all of those variables, is when you take into the account uh, at the same time profitability, uh, part, uh, revenues, uh, the uh, square meters that uh, are uh, there for the particular city, uh, and so on and so forth. Basically, you're trying to build a grouping of uh, cities based on as many data points and as many viable business metrics that are there. Uh, it can be done uh, with uh, really simple statistic tools. And at some point, you just put all the data in the system and the system tells you, okay, based on the information that you have gave me, you have, let's say, three types of cities. The big cities with the big revenues, but low margins, the big cities with big revenues and high margins, and small cities with average revenues and average margins, for example. And um, this tool and this trick allows you to not build the system of 300 different types of cities, but with uh, a lower number of um, categories, which will allow you to differentiate the reward. Um, uh, and in terms of the particular yeah. project, what did we do? Yes, Sari? Yeah, yeah, this is helpful. We've um, we've dealt with uh, clustering in a number of the webinars that we've done. You know, we were looking at it when we, for example, talked about strategic workforce planning. How can you find people who do similar jobs by clustering their capabilities together? But in this case, you you did. I just had a question on tool. What what tool were you using to create this clustering around um, 
this set of cities, Igor? Uh, basically, we did it in R. Uh, um, uh, my team uh, usually works with uh, R or Python. Mm, and it's yeah. the the R is uh, freeware, and you just need a, a couple of weeks of training uh, to work with it. And it can do basically any statistical trick and any statistical analysis that might be required for HR analytics. Okay. Good. So uh, for the particular client, uh, at some point we said you just can't operate the reward system that have 300 cities. You need to cluster those, yes? Uh, and to do so, first of all, uh, you need to define the set of indicators which differentiate one city from another. Then we will cluster those in terms of statistics and we will tell you that, okay, in, in reality you have not 300 cities, but let's say 10 clusters. Uh, 10 types of cities that you are operating in and you should differentiate your reward based on this typology. Uh, of course, besides just simple uh, data gathering and, and statistical clustering, you need to also do the logical check uh, during this exercise because uh, there is um, not all data can be gathered. Uh, there are some plans for this or that particular city. There is the operational business plans. There is uh, some specifics of cities of presence which cannot be uh, digitized. For example, in Russia, we have this term called cities of the far north. Uh, it's uh, basically, it's the cities uh, to which you can't get uh, at the old 12 months of the year. So the weather there is so bad that at some point for a month or two or three, the city is, uh, well, basically just can't there. And this uh, requires some specific logistics. Uh, this is requires some specific uh, financial investments in these types of city and in operating in these types of city. So you can't put this in the database, you can't put this into the clustering, but you have to be cautious of this when you're thinking about the grouping of the cities. Uh, and after you're having this 10 or 9 or 11 groups of cities, you basically can go to uh, the exercise of setting the particular salary levels. So that's what we have done in the uh, project. We gathered a lot of data. We had about uh, 35 uh, variables. They were uh, of the different type. For example, we analyzed the org charts and the structure of the uh, the well basically the org structure of the part of the organization and how it operates in the city we looked at the financial data we looked at the revenue at the costs and the profits uh in the particular year and in the previous years for all of the cities we looked at the dynamics of profitability of course, we looked at the people side because uh, the turnover uh, and the amount of people working in, in the uh, this or that city is the very important uh, driver of adding the uh, city to one or another cluster. And we looked at the client basis uh, uh, and the client information. What type of clients do we have in this or that city? Uh, what is the size of the warehouses? What is the type of the warehouses? and so on and so forth. So there were a lot of um, thinking before you, well, basically it's the ground rule of the chart analytic. Before you do any exercise in statistics, think very good, what data do you need? What questions do you answer? And what should you put into the database? And uh, what should you do with the data? So that, that, that was quite an exercise. Uh, I will not be uh, given a lot of details here, but at the end we got the nine clusters. They very, uh, they were uh, very different. Uh, as you can see, for example, uh, the population of the city, uh, the uh, average income in the city, and you have to understand that uh, since we are talking about the FMCG organization, the uh, income of the city is a very good predictor of the amount of revenues that the company will be doing in the city. And uh, some other uh, data points and some other features of the city that we were taking into analysis, they all worked.
let's put it that way. And we were able to uh, not just do this statistical exercise, but then prove to the CE4, to the CEO, that this is the logical way in which you should cluster your organization. And that was quite an, quite an insight for them. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left for the webinar, and I have about uh, 10 more slides, so I'll try to uh, speak a little faster. Um, but we have two more steps and two more parts of the project to uh, discuss. So, after the first part of the project, you have the understanding of what are the implications of uh, external uh, markets and what are the salary levels at the external markets in each and every city that uh, you are working in on the one hand and on the other hand you do understand uh, what is the comparative value of this or that city uh, for the organization and that allows you basically to decide on the particular salary point which we you will be paying for the particular job in the particular city um, and that's basically just what we have done. Usually, I don't know whether or not you are aware of the of this practice. Usually, organizations try to look at the uh, salary, at the mean salary at the market. Uh, uh, that means that uh, you just look at the salary review and uh, uh, deciding to pay the uh, money for which 50 of the companies pay more, 50% of the companies in this or that particular city, and 50% of the companies pay less. So you take the median of the market. Some organizations go for the 75th percentile or maybe 90th percentile of the market. That means that uh, they want to attract the best talent. They want to pay as much as possible to get the best people for the market. But that comes with the cost because you have to pay more. Other organizations, they uh, decide uh, to pay less to get not the best people but maybe newbies, maybe the uh, interns, maybe the people who are just entering the profession but pay less. Um, the decision about uh, what is the particular seller levels and what how much should we pay compared to the market, usually it's a very discussionable decision. Uh, when well, well basically what I see in my practice Every time you have to set the salary point, it's always a discussion which uh, sometimes can go dramatically loud. But uh, when you have data, when you have the understanding on the one hand of the salary uh, levels in the city and on the other hand, when you have the understanding of the importance of this particular uh, job and of this particular city for the organization, it's quite easy to make that decision. It's quite easy to pay lower salaries, decidedly to pay lower salaries in the cities when you where you don't get a lot of value, and it's quite easy to pay higher salaries in the cities where the organization gets a lot of value. So basically when you have the databases which we created in the uh, first part of the project, the uh, setting salary exercise was quite technical. The other thing that uh, we also had to do is not uh, just set the one particular salary level for every job in every city, but to set the um, fork or salary range. In Russia we call it Vilka, it's called uh, salary fork. It's the highest and lowest levels that can be received, uh, highest and lowest salary that can be received by the person. Um, uh, which is holding the job. Uh, usually about 60 uh, to 70 to 80 percent of the employees in this particular job are receiving uh, the target salary levels, for, for example, uh, median of the market. But definitely there is always uh, a need to pay somebody more because you have a highly qualified person in the job or you have a very, a, pot a very potential talent or maybe some jobs are just key for the organization and that uh, and said and the question of how much can we pay higher than the target salary level is a very good question uh, the same logic must be applied to the paying lower than target salary level. If you have uh, employees who have just entered the job, if you uh, have uh, low performers, uh, how can you pay them? What's the lowest amount of money that you 
have to pay them and what are the rules of setting the particular salary for the particular person in the particular grade. Um, the topic that we are covering today is not um, about that, but I just wanted to highlight these questions and this type of questions and say that there is a lot of uh, research and there is a lot of um, information on that uh, topics. And uh, when you're building the uh, balanced reward system, you have to keep in mind that this is the question that you have to answer. How much we will be paying to high performers and how much we will be paying to low performers. And the last part of the project, after setting the salary levels, understanding the salary levels, after setting the salary for forks for particular uh, jobs, was the question of administration of the system. <clears throat> how do we manage that? How, how do we work with the system? Uh, uh, we proposed two approach for the client to decide. First of all, of course, you can, if you have 300 cities and let's say 15 jobs, uh, in 15 unique jobs in each of the city, it's quite hard to manage the system. And uh, there is always uh, a uh, possibility to say, okay, we have created like 11 categories, 11 clusters of cities, and we will just have the similar uh, salary levels and similar forks for every city in the category. That will allow us to spend a, uh, much less time uh, on the administration, much le less time on the uh, requests from the management, and so on and so forth. Uh, we will have just basically 11 sal salary forks. But uh, this comes with the price. When you don't look at every city and when you don't look at every job, when you don't look at every uh, employee that you are paying, basically you might lose money, just as I have illustrated it on uh, this slide. For example, let's look at the chart at the lower left of the uh, slide. Let's say you have six towns. Each of those has the uh, particular market salary and when you are having not the town by town reward system but cluster by cluster of towns reward system it is quite obvious that you will be overpaying in some cities in the cluster and underpaying in other cities in the cluster which will lead on the one hand to basically wasting your money and uh, putting your money not in the right place in the cities when you uh, pay too much and losing people in the cities when you don't pay enough. So uh, basically when I get uh, questions about how do you administer such a massive and such a complex system, um, I say, well, it's tough and you have to um, digitize it and make it IT solution as soon as possible, but you just have to look at every particular city or you will just lose the essence of the exercise. It just doesn't make sense to get through all the story, get all uh, through all those steps that I have mentioned and described above to understand the salary levels in the particular city, to understand what is the value for the company of the particular city, to understand how much should we pay for the particular job in the particular city, and then uh, don't apply it. Uh, unfortunately, at least in Russia and in some uh, Eastern European countries, uh, I see that there is a tendency to oversimplify the reward systems, partly because there is no data, partly because there is uh, lack of resources to uh, manage the complex uh, salary system, and that leads to uh, loss of money. That leads, uh, that leads to the uh, inappropriate spending of the money. Uh, basically, that's what I have said to the HRD, and then that's what I have said to the CEO of the particular company in the particular project, and that's why they have decided to add two more FTEs to the HR department uh, for the for the task of simply managing that systems, managing that system of reward. And they basically won with that uh, because a return on investment that we had for the project was quite significant. Some approximate numbers are here on the slide, but uh, the more important thing is that, uh, as I have mentioned, we have um, made this project about a year and a half ago, and the attrition 
in the cities in, uh, where we said, okay, guys, you are paying not enough. You have to increase the salaries in this particular city if you want to be competitive and if you want to balance the reward and the uh, value for the organization, which is created by the particular person. So the attrition in these cities, it dropped significantly. And the organization in the last uh, one and a half years, I have been contacting with them uh, regarding the project. They were very happy not about the cost saving which we provided to them, but they were more happy about the increased opportunities to deliver business results in the particular cities that we were having with this system. Uh, and that returns us to the first point which we have mentioned with Sarah at this presentation uh, about why do you apply HR analytics to reward? You apply HR analytics to reward, uh, first of all, of course, to make the decisions that you're having, uh, that you have to make a little more elaborate and a little more conscious and a little more data driven, but in the end, that allows you to uh, get more from the people you're having, get more for your workforce. Basically, that's it. In the last um, slide, I, thanks. yeah. Yeah, thanks, Igor. Just before you, uh, I think this, uh, I think this last slide is worth how you can do it by yourself is worth dwelling on. But I just mm -hmm. want to remind people we do have, we will have a couple of minutes for Q and A. So if you mm -hmm. want to start uh, typing in your questions into the Q and A box, that would be great. So sorry to interrupt you, Igor. How okay. can you do it by yourself? So if people are people are listening to this and saying. How can I apply this to my own organization? Okay, well, uh, long story short, uh, although the um, the case that I have described, it might sound a little bit overwhelming and a little bit hard, but it's not that hard in practice. Basically, the things that you will need is more or less sound data about the organization on the one hand about the people uh, and about the workforce, on the other hand about key uh, metrics that you are having, uh, key business metrics that company uh, looks at and which affect uh, company performance. Then to work with this external competitiveness, you might also need uh, some market data, uh, both from the provider and of course you will need the uh, data from the state authorities. Uh, I'm quite sure that uh, in every European Union country, you have a lot of uh, this data, of course, in Russia, sometimes it's tricky. Uh, and um, besides data and the understanding of how you should work with the data, you just need a very simple tools and a very simple statistical uh, exercises. Uh, any person who is uh, fluent in basic math can read a couple of books, can take, for example, this R tool, which I have mentioned previously, just R, like in response, first, first, uh, uh, the R. And you will need only that. You gather the data on the cities, you gather the uh, data from the provider, you put that in the R, you do the simple regression. There is uh, already solutions for this uh, in uh, open source um, internet. All, after that, you just have the business relevant metrics data and you make the clustering with them. And you have the understanding of uh, relative value of this or that. It might be city, it might be sales team, it might be, I don't know, any unit that you're working with. It might be even the uh, value of this or that particular job that you are dealing with. Uh, and after that, once again, say, in the salary levels when you have the understanding of the markets and when you have the understanding of the value of the particular city, it's quite simple. You don't need any specific uh, skills and you don't need any specific tools uh, that are not available at the moment freely in Coursera, in internet or in the books. Uh, hopefully I was able to describe you the flow of the work that you are dealing with. I will be happy to answer any questions at this moment or you can contact me uh, later via Facebook, via my email. Uh, I'm much better in uh, written English than in oral English. Uh, I will be happy to help. Basically that's it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you Igor. Appreciate that. Um, 
I, and I think a really interesting example in terms of how you can really look at your reward in a different way and start to start to think about um, the different dimensions and how the data you have got can can really help you. I'm just having a look to see if we uh, have got any questions coming through on the Q&A. Uh, uh, don't take it personally, Igor. Sometimes we have loads of questions, and uh, quite a lot of the time we don't have uh, any questions. Uh, we have one question, which is to play, uh, share the slides. Of course, we actually uh, share the recording of the uh, the webinar, but uh, specifically for you, we'll also uh, get you a copy of the slides too. Okay. Uh, any other any other questions that people have? I mean, maybe just a bit around. So, I mean, the opportunity, the opportunity was there for this, um, you know, saving and better use of the investment and spend. Can you maybe just say a couple of things about how the organisation went about implementing uh, once they had this new data and this new insight in terms of their uh, in terms of their reward landscape across all of these different geographies, how, how did they then take it into the business and really make this live? That's quite a good question. Thank you. Um, basically, oh, I see. There's one more question, and I will be happy to answer it. In terms of implementation, when you have the design of the system, uh, you roll it on the organization. In uh, well, you, you, you of course you don't uh, lower their salaries for their people in the jobs that have to be with the lower salary, but you do increase uh, the salaries for the underpaid. Uh, and um, uh, for the particular project, we created a six months rollout plan. Uh, thankfully, the specificity of the attrition in this industry, well, they, they were losing people a lot. They The average lifespan of the person in, uh, in the company was about year and a half. Uh, so whenever there was a placement in the organization, whenever they looked for a new person, they looked for, uh, they used a new salary uh, structure, a new salary level for this particular job. And by now, almost 60% uh, of the staff that was in the perimeter of the project, uh, they are working under new salaries, under refreshed salaries. The 40% of the staff are working uh, in the old system, well, because you just can't lower the reward by, by Russian laws, by compliance with the Russian uh, uh, labor laws, you can't lower the reward in any case. Uh, but you can wait till the person leaves, and then when you are looking for a new person, you will just set a new salary for uh, the, uh, the the guy or the girl that you will be uh, attracting. So it took them some time to implement, but it, it was quite technical. You just change the salary levels at the recruitment. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So there's another uh, question. So thank you for this exciting presentation. I'm wondering about the amount of data needed to support such a project. So general data per city, maybe not sufficient. And maybe mm -hmm. the client will ask specific questions about uh, how relevant is the data to specific types of jobs or market practices. That's so a very good really question. really specific question of, yeah, a really good question around kind of, you know, the data and the validity of the data that you need to use. Well, of course, the... Uh the more people and the more jobs are there in the project perimeter, the more complex the data becomes. For the particular project, as I have mentioned, we were dealing mostly with low-level uh, sales and logistics. So it was first-line salespeople, and it was uh, people who are operating the warehouses. Uh, so in terms of difference, we, we, we basically had two types of work, two types of jobs uh, in the particular project. But you are quite right in your question that when uh, you are going uh, into specific um, types of um, work, you will have to, uh, the, the complexity of the project will increase. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, in terms of data needed, you need a better understanding of the um, you need a better understanding of the workforce and of the competences 
which you are dealing with, but uh, usually all salary providers, they do have a very specific set of data for a very specific types of jobs. So for example, they provide you with information uh, on how much is data engineer is paid in this city or how much the uh, HR professional uh, is paid in this city and they vary that by grade. So in this uh, essence, uh, you will need data from the organization and uh, the, the more complex the organization, the more complex the data you will be having, but the providers will cover all the needs for the external data. And once again, if we are talking about the uh, official statistics, well, of course, they do not they do not uh, differentiate the types of jobs and the, the types of uh, work. They only set the average wage, but uh, you only use this in the regression. Uh, well, I hope I have answered the question. Super. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Igor. And uh, I think we're out of time. And uh, but thank you ever so much for joining us this morning from Moscow. We've had an international audience today from uh, uh, from far afield across Europe. So thank you ever so much for your time and attention. And uh, there are no uh, webinars planned at the moment, but we will be uh, working on those. We'll take a pause through the summer and then relaunch again. In, uh, in, the, in the awesome. Igor, thank you ever so much for joining us and we'll make sure people have your contact details should they wish to reach out for further questions. Thank Enjoy you, Sarah. The rest of your thank you. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, everyone. Bye for now.